Now, before I finish up support vector machines, I just want to give you um, just a perspective and a little short recap. So support vector machines are incredibly elegant. I fell in love with support vector machines, which is why I'm doing machine learning. I'm completely serious about that. I love the idea of maximizing margins so that, you know, among all solutions that classify the data perfectly, you get the ones with the largest margins. Um, I think that whole idea and its ties to generalization are really cool. Also, uh, the fact that the functional margin actually equals the geometric margin gives you a really nice way to visualize the data, visualize the problem, and sort of see into what's actually going on. So I love the fact that the choices that were made in SVM allowed these two allowed this geometric perspective to actually be sort of the same the same as the functional perspective that we that we work with in equations. It's also very mathematically sophisticated. I mean, the fact that it uses convex optimization, it's, it's such a beautiful theory. And also the fact that, um, you know, you get these globally optimal solutions, because as I mentioned, when you're minimizing convex functions, any locally optimal solution is a globally optimal solution. So there's some really beautiful methodological appeal that um, every time you find a solution to the SVM problem, it is a global solution. Right? This is not the same thing as neural networks where you like minimize some objective and you have no idea whether you're getting to the minimum or not. So there's something really truly, truly appealing about knowing that you don't need to know anything about optimization and you're going to get to the minimum of this objective and you don't need to fiddle with it, nothing. It'll get you there. Just by using the, the KKT conditions and, you know, and, and SMO, right? It's also, um, it's also serendipitous. It's actually kind of really lucky that, you know, the support vectors themselves have, these, have this beautiful interpretation, right? The support vectors are the closest points to the decision boundary, and the whole function ends up relying just on those points, right? None of the other points factor into, you know, you can, you can basically ignore them. The only points that really matter are the points that are close to the decision boundary. And so the, the formulation is kind of lucky in the sense that you, you only have to depend on these few points. And so I, I find that very beautiful about support vector machines. Yeah, so the support vectors solely determine the decision boundary. And then the elegance even continues when we get to kernels, because then you don't have to even work with linear models. You can work with arbitrary nonlinear models and still have all the same machinery and convex optimization still working for you. Anyway, so those are the reasons why I really like support vector machines. Um, and also, I should mention that SVM inspired a whole generation of scientists to work in machine learning, right? This is, this is something that, um, that people really found uh, very, very appealing. On the other hand, SVMs do have some disadvantages. So the kernels that we haven't talked about yet, but I'll tell you next, um, these, the kernels are usually chosen beforehand by a human, right, by an analyst. And because of that, the kernels essentially define a distance metric in a high dimensional space. And so when humans choose distance metrics in high dimensional spaces, it doesn't always work out so well because humans aren't great at choosing high dimensional functions um, in their heads. And so it tends to fail in kind of large, larger numbers of dimensions and tends to get kind of dominated by methods like boosting where things are adaptive, right? Boosting is sort of dividing up the space in an, in an adaptive way so that, um, that the distance between data points is adapted to the, to the space. And also, I, I already have warned you, but I'll warn you again, that you need to watch out for bad solvers because there are bad SVM solvers kind of in various places and they can be kind of slow. And so if you're, you know, for example, um, I've seen SVM solvers where even in two dimensions, it, it couldn't solve the problem, which doesn't make any sense because this, You've, you've seen the problem. You know that it should be solvable very, very quickly in low dimensions. So I'm not sure why, um, why that's true, why these like, bad solvers have been allowed to propagate, because there are also good solvers that those are the ones that we should be using. Okay, so next up, I will talk about kernels. <laughs>